How many solutions are there to a locked room murder? Just four, and we're gonna break down all of them. Hey everybody, welcome back to Fiction Technician. If you haven't been here before, my name is Jane Kalmus. I am a writer of historical cozy mysteries, and today I'm talking to you about locked room murders. Okay, we are going to talk about all the possible solutions to locked room murders, and we're going to give them names because, well, when you name something, it becomes kind of easier to think about it and recall it to mind when you're ready to sit down and pull out a mystery. We're going to talk about possible variations, and we're going to see how the same solution can be made to feel fresh and novel based on the details of the story surrounding it. Okay, this video has been a long time in the making, literally since the beginning of the COVID quarantine in March. I have been re-watching episodes of the 2002 USA series Monk, and I've been forcing my husband to watch right along with me because, um, togetherness. Uh, why Monk? Well, Monk is the show I know that deals most heavily in how done it. That is, mysteries where the primary question surrounds not who committed the murder or why, but rather how they got the deed done. So we're going to look at several episodes of Monk and kind of dissect how their solutions are structured. So let's start off by defining some terms. For a locked room murder, we obviously are going to need a locked room, but we don't have to define this 100% literally. Our locked room is going to be defined as an area which no one can access without being seen. This covers a lot of ground. It includes train cars, elevators, and a couple of unique examples we're going to be seeing coming up. We are also going to need a very limited number of people in that locked room, either just the victim or the victim and one other character who we're going to call the Patsy. The Patsy is a character in the locked room with the victim who will be blamed for the crime. Because they were alone with the victim, they're going to assume to be guilty by most people, but our sleuth isn't gonna buy it. He believes the Patsy is innocent, and because of that, we the audience believe it too. We're going to see how these elements play out in an episode of Monk, but first, take a second to hit the like button if you enjoy what I'm doing on this channel, and if you really want to help me out, share this video with another writer who you think might like to write a locked room murder. Okay, let's take a look at an episode called Mr. Monk Goes to the Carnival. In this episode, police officer Adam Kirk meets an informant at a carnival. The informant wants privacy and says he'll only talk if the officer agrees to go up on the Ferris wheel with him, and that will become our locked room, okay? Nobody can enter or exit their car on the Ferris wheel. They get on the ride, but as soon as they go up... Hey! Somebody call the cops! Calm down! He's trying to kill me! What are you talking about? The Ferris wheel operator stops the car and the officer walks away, but he's quickly called back. The informant has been killed. So the informant is obviously our victim, and Officer Kirk is the patsy. Not only is he on the hook for murder, but the suspicion he's under is going to undermine his testimony against an alleged murderer, Leonard Stokes. Your Honor, we can no longer vouch for Lieutenant Kirk. Well, then you leave me no choice. Without your witness, the statements that Mr. Stokes made in the back of that squad car are inadmissible. So I'm free to go? I'm sorry to say that's true. Our protagonist, Adrian Monk, investigates and learns that Stoke hired the informant to set Kirk up. The informant's job was to pretend to be attacked so that Kirk would look like an abusive cop who extorted Stokes' confession through violence. Only the informant wasn't in on the whole plan. Stokes doesn't want to make Kirk look merely violent or hot-headed. He wants to make him look like a killer. But Stokes wasn't on the scene, so how did he do it? Well, he had another confederate, the Ferris wheel operator. As soon as she stopped the Ferris wheel and Kirk left the car, she killed the informant. We're going to call this solution a time-shifted murder, one in which the murder didn't actually happen while the room was locked. We're going to talk more about the elements you need to construct a good time-shifted murder, but first let's look at one more episode and talk about what they have in common. In the episode, Mr. Monk goes to the theater. He attends a hit play in which his friend Gail is starring. But in the big scene, Gail's co-star winds up dead. Mine. <laughs> You okay? So here, our locked room is the stage. Uh, it may seem strange to think of a stage as a locked room, but remember, all we need is a place that no one can get to without being seen. And since the audience is there, obviously no one can enter the stage without being seen. And Gail is our Patsy, the obvious culprit who our sleuth believes to be innocent. Monk quickly zeroes in on the actual killer, Gail's understudy, who was looking to take over her part in the play and rocket herself on the way to success as an actress. Frequently, in a how done it, the sleuth is going to deduce the true killer's identity very early on, either because her attitude just seems off or perhaps because of some small circumstantial clue, something that's not enough to be conclusive but just points in her direction. And that's what happens in this episode when Monk learns that the understudy Jenna booked a salon appointment for her opening night. So? She wants to look good for her debut. Yes, yes, but 
But look, according to this, she made this appointment two weeks ago. How did she know she'd be on stage? From that point on, Monk is actively pursuing Jenna and eventually he puts together her plan. She rubbed the apples on stage with peanut oil, causing the victim to have an allergic reaction. When he collapses, Jenna's father, who is just as obsessed with her success as she is, pretends to be a doctor so that he can rush on stage. While everyone is distracted, he stabs the victim. Okay, these two episodes show the exact same murder. Okay, let's go over the steps again. Step one, the victim and the patsy enter the locked room. Kirk and his informant go up on the Ferris wheel and Gail and her co-star begin their scene. Step two, the Patsy appears to be attacked. In the case of the informant, it's because he's pretending to be attacked. And in the case of the actor, he's experiencing a different kind of attack, an allergic attack. Step three, the locked room is opened. The Ferris wheel stopped and people begin to enter the stage. Step four, one of the people who opened the locked room kills the victim. These murders even share the same motive. Neither killer is really all that interested in killing the victim. Their true desire was to frame the patsy. So in many ways, these two episodes are one and the same, but because of the surrounding details, they feel delightfully different. And this is really one of the points I want you to walk away with from this video. Okay, these solutions I'm sharing with you, these are just structures. The plot is not just the solution, but everything surrounding it, the particular tricks the murderer has to play in order to get the solution to work and the clues he leaves behind that will allow our sleuth to eventually unmask him and so much more. So you don't have to feel shy about using one of these solutions. There, there are really only so many of them, just like there's only so many ways to fill in a tic-tac-toe grid. And your creativity is going to come into play into everything surrounding the solution, including the setting. You know, these two episodes have very different, exciting settings that are fun to explore. They also have different character arcs. In one case, this is uh, Monk not really trusting the Patsy, and in the other, it's kind of a fun fish out of water story where he delves into theater life. And all this adds up to two very engaging stories that feel very different. So there's no problem with taking one of these solutions and making it your own in your own story. The basic elements you're going to need for a time-shifted murder are a murder that happens either before or after the room was locked and deceptions that make it appear as though the murder happened while the room was locked. One of these deceptions is almost always going to be a false attack, a particular moment when witnesses believe that the victim is being murdered, and we saw that in both the previous episodes. Okay, but let's just take a look at an episode where more deceptions are needed to complete the murderer's plan. This is an episode where the murder is time shifted forwards. That is, the murder happened before the room was locked, but appears to happen later. The captain of a submarine kills one of his officers and then locks him in his room and returns to the bridge. When the officer doesn't report for a drill, the captain and some other officers go to check on him and hear a gunshot. They break down the door and find the officer dead. This case has three deceptions that make the murder appear to have happened while the room was locked. First, the captain muffled the gunshot by using a plastic bottle as a homemade silencer. Okay, that's the real attack and it has to be disguised or else the plan won't work. Second, he used a cigarette as a fuse to light a firecracker. This firecracker goes off five minutes later, creating a bang that everyone believes to be a gunshot. That's our false attack, and it happens when the murderer is comfortably outside the room in full view of witnesses. And last, he slipped the key into the victim's pocket when he entered the room, creating the impression that it was the victim who had locked the room. Time-shifted murders are one of the most popular locked room solutions, but they're not the only one. Let's look at a fun episode called Mr. Monk and the Panic Room. Record producer Ian Blackburn is working at home when he hears his security system warn him of an intruder. He retreats to his panic room with his pet chimp Darwin, but when the police arrive later, uh, you guessed it. Ian is dead and Darwin is holding the weapon. Monk's assistant Sharona just knows Darwin has to be innocent because he's so cute. That thing can straight up rip your face off. Don't ever lock yourself in a room with a frightened chimp. Monk investigates and eventually realizes that the man who installed the panic room also created a hidden entrance to it because he was in love with Ian's wife and planned to kill Ian so they could be together. Okay, this is what we're going to call a gained access murder. This is where the killer manages to make his way into the locked room, kill the victim, and make his way out again without anyone being the wiser. This would include murders where people enter from secret passages, where they jimmy locks or gain access to keys via any method. For this murder, there's basically one thing you're going to need, and that's a clever way for the murderer to get into and out of the room. Okay, I think with the these, the challenge is making that mode of entry feel ingenious enough. Uh, you don't want a character to just pick up a key that happens to be lying around. You want him to be clever in getting into the room, and I feel like installing a fake entrance in a panic room totally fits that bill. 
All right, let's take a look at another solution through a fun episode called Mr. Monk and the Redheaded Stranger, which features country music star Willie Nelson. In this one, Willie's manager is murdered in an alleyway next to a radio station where Willie is about to give an interview. Willie hears the shots and comes running. He finds the body along with a terrified witness. The witness is blind, but she says she heard the killer's voice and in a police lineup, she identifies Willie Nelson. Tell anybody about this and I'll kill you. That's him. That, that's the voice, that's him. We eventually learn that although the woman was blind, she began to recover her sight some years ago. She's the one who shot the manager because he killed her family years ago during an accident he had while driving drunk. Okay, this is what we're going to call an extra people murder. And it's a mystery in which the murderer is in the locked room with the victim the entire time. For this kind of mystery, you're going to need a murderer who is in the locked room with the victim who is either A, concealed, so maybe they've been physically hidden under the floorboards or in a suit of armor, or B, excluded from suspicion. Let's take a look at the scene where the blind lady is specifically excluded from suspicion. The first shot was point blank. Even the blind woman could have done that one. But the second shot, the second shot, 20 feet away, the moving target, impossible. So in this case, she's been excluded because she's considered physically incapable of committing the crime. There are other ways that a killer might exclude themselves from suspicion. Uh, perhaps they could make themselves look like a second victim who just barely survived. Or I can imagine an extra people murder in which the murderer is disregarded because uh, he's not a people at all. You know, we just talked about a plot where a pet, Darwin the Chimp, was the patsy. I could easily imagine a mystery where the pet was the extra person in a locked room who committed the murder. And the other thing that you need to make this kind of mystery work, if you have a patsy in this plot, you need a reason why the patsy doesn't understand the whole story. If Willie could simply tell the investigators that he saw the blind woman shoot his manager, well, the story would be over. His version of events might seem unlikely, but it would be checked out and the truth would eventually come out. Uh, in this mystery, Willie doesn't know what happened because he entered the alley in response to the shots. Other reasons the Patsy might not be able to tell the tale would be if he were unconscious, drugged, or if he was considered terribly unreliable. I've talked before on this channel about how a plot twist is nothing more than something the reader believes that turns out to be false, and that's exactly what happened with each of our first three solutions. Okay, there's a basic belief introduced at the beginning of Locked Room Murders, which is the victim was alone, not, not including the Patsy. The Patsy doesn't count for these purposes. The victim was alone in a locked room when he died. And we can see how each of these three solutions requires us to invalidate this belief in some way. For a time-shifted murder, we can strike through when he died. Uh, he was actually only in the locked room before or after his death. For a gains access murder, we can strike through locked. The room wasn't as locked or inaccessible as it appeared to be. And for an extra people murder, we can strike through alone because the killer was with him. But we're not done yet. We've got one last murder, and this is what you might think of as a classic locked room murder. There's no Patsy in this episode, just a victim alone in a room that's locked from the inside. The publisher of Sapphire Men's Magazine has been arguing with his business partner, Dexter Morgan. In fact, he's about to shut the whole magazine down, but then one morning while he's working out, he gets a call from Dexter. We're gonna have to sell it. Is that your final decision? I'm afraid so, Dexter. Okay. To your funeral. <laughs> oh. Oh. Monk investigates and learns that Dexter used an incredibly powerful electromagnet to pull the bar under his partner from the room below. Okay, although he's currently the publisher of a raunchy men's magazine, he has a history as a science nerd and that's established early on, so the, the fact that he built a high-powered magnet isn't going to feel like it comes out of nowhere. This is a solution we're going to call exterior forces. and. All along in this video, I've been trying to tell you exactly what puzzle pieces you're going to need to construct each solution, but uh, here, I can't help you much. The use of the electromagnet is really, it's, it's just a delightfully creative idea on the part of the writers, and I think it goes to show that while I may think I've cracked the case on locked room murders, there may be still some out there that I haven't thought of. When it comes to exterior forces, I don't think that I would use the same Solution, magnetism, I'd find it hard to differentiate it from this plot, but I'd be thinking about anything I could manipulate from outside a room. Poison gases, maybe the temperature, maybe a machine controlled by remote. 
I have actually written a locked room murder called Murder on Lake Michigan. It's a short novella in my Kitty Callahan series about a secretary to a hard-boiled sleuth in 1920s Chicago. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which solution I used, but that book will be coming out in the next month, and I'll be giving you more details on that as we get closer to the publication date. If you want to see a video on perfect alibi murders, subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Perfect alibis are the close cousin of locked room murders. They're a how done it where instead of worrying so much about the where of the murder, we're worrying about the when because the killer has a perfect alibi for that exact moment in time. I've got a video on those coming up and I'm also really excited to share with you my quarter million word challenge, which is the productivity and habit forming challenge I'm setting for myself in the new year. I hope you will join me with it. Check out.